A group of key Republicans in the House of Representatives has urged President Joe Biden to lift restrictions on the use of American weapons for strikes deep into Russian territory, reports CNN. The letter was sent ahead of U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to Kiev. It was signed by Michael McCall, House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman, Michael Turner, House Intelligence Committee Chairman, Mike Rogers, House Armed Services Committee Chairman, Ken Calvert, House Appropriations Subcommittee Chairman, Thomas Keene, House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee Chairman, Richard Hudson, Helsinki Commissioner. The Biden administration fears that allowing Ukraine to conduct further strikes on Russian territory could lead to an escalation of the conflict and provoke the Kremlin to accuse the U.S. of direct involvement in the war. However, in their letter, Republican lawmakers argue that the administration's concerns about escalation have been consistently disproven since the start of the war. Neither Ukraine's use of U.S.-provided weapons in Russia nor its military incursion into Russia's Kursk region, the first foreign occupation of Russian territory since World War II, have triggered a Russian escalatory response, they wrote. An American official also told CNN that U.S. intelligence estimates show that more than 90% of Russian aircraft launching glide bombs and missiles at Ukraine are based at airfields located at least 300 kilometers from Ukrainian-controlled territory. This supposedly limits the effectiveness of ATACMS systems, which cannot reach those distances. We expect this number to continue to increase. For example, Russia recently relocated its glide bomb missions from two airfields, which were located closer to the front, farther east to airfields that are outside of range of ATACMS, said the official. Meanwhile, the Republican lawmakers argue in their letter that numerous other legitimate military targets remain within range on Russian territory. The Institute for the Study of War assesses that, excluding airfields, there are over 200 legitimate military targets within range of U.S.-provided weapons to include military bases, logistics nodes, fuel depots, ammunition warehouses, and command and control systems, they wrote. The lawmakers also assert that the restrictions hinder Ukraine's ability to prevail in its fight against Russian aggression and provide Kremlin forces with a refuge from which they can attack Ukraine with impunity. It is far past time the administration reverses course and lifts the remaining restrictions on Ukraine's use of U.S.-provided weapons against legitimate military targets in Russia, they concluded. An anonymous U.S. official told CNN that the U.S. has supplied Ukraine with several hundred ATACMS missile systems and that Ukraine has used most of them. The official noted that the U.S. has a limited stockpile of missile systems that can be provided to Ukraine without compromising its military readiness. Using this weaponry for strikes deep inside Russia would deplete Ukraine's ATACMS reserves, which could otherwise be used for other parts of its military campaign, such as in Crimea. However, the CNN source mentioned that, according to Ukrainian officials, there are targets within the missile range that include weapons production facilities which could be considered legitimate military objectives. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is counting on international pressure on Russia to end the war this fall on terms acceptable to him, writes EFE. With prospects on the front lines dim and military aid from some key allies at risk, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is working on a unilateral roadmap to end the war this fall and is relying on international pressure on Russia to achieve peace on terms acceptable to Kiev. The article says, as the media notes, Zelensky first revealed the details of his victory plan on August the 27th. I built this plan based on the fact that it can be implemented thanks to our partners and not the will or unwillingness of the Russian Federation, the Ukrainian president said. One of the main levers for achieving this goal will be the success of the Ukrainian operation in the Kursk region. In parallel with the presentation of this plan to its partners, Kyiv is preparing to organize a second peace summit by the end of the year to which, unlike the first, it plans to invite Russia. It is clear from statements by Zelensky and other Ukrainian politicians that the purpose of the second meeting is to put pressure on Russia to agree to peace on the terms proposed by Kyiv in a document which may or may not be the so-called victory plan that it will present at the summit, the newspaper writes. At the same time, the effectiveness of this pressure largely depends on the position of powers close to Russia, 
such as China and India, which are so far unwilling to use their influence on Moscow to force Russia to completely or partially leave Ukraine, as Zelensky demands. Polls in Ukraine show support for talks with Russia has grown. However, as the Wall Street Journal reports, one key group of the population remains negative about any deal with Russia, the military. Only 18% of veterans and servicemen believe that Ukraine should seek to end the war through negotiations. At the same time, 15% of soldiers and veterans said they would join an armed protest if Kyiv signed a peace treaty with which they disagree.